Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, audience online. Um, we're here for a program called Marine Zoonomy. Um, and we'll be having a few of the organizers and curators of Marine Zoonomy. Marine Zoonomy is a series of workshops. Um, and we've arrived at the end of the series. Um, and we'll be talking with Klaas Kuitenbrouwer and Chef Van Gaalen uh, about their experiences. Maybe, I'm not sure, there will be a few of the participants. Um, I'm very curious. Uh, let's get started. Uh, Klaas and Chef, are you there? Yep. Yeah, hey. Yeah. Good morning, Arjan. I don't see Klaas yet. Hi there. And there's Klaas. I'm here. <laughs> uh, but I can't hear you. I have no audio. Ah, okay. Well, we'll just talk into the void. That's how it goes these days. We're working on the audio. Stay with us. I think. Yeah, I have audio now. Super. So only now I can hear what you're saying. I don't know how much you've been saying before that. Oh, that's all right. Okay. Okay. Um, welcome, uh, Chef, uh, with the to me appearing blue sweater and class with uh, the gray sweater. Um, nice to have you here. Um, yeah. Let's talk a bit about this workshop that you've been doing um, and the results, marine zoonomy. Um, maybe just as a first short introduction, uh, explain to the viewers at home what marine zoonomy is about. Sure, well, uh, uh, we'll talk about it in more detail when we get into kind of our presentation-y uh, part, but in short, marine zoonomy is an exploration of a near future, hopefully not entirely fictional scenario, um, in which we're playing with the idea of um, could we transform the obsolete fossil fuel infrastructures that exist currently in the North Sea and use these for some alternative purpose um, along the lines of hubs for uh, uh, some kind of regenerative ecology, a uh, sustainable aquaculture or renewable energy uh, or something like this. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, let me, how would you like to go, uh, to go uh, about with this session? You would to pre present some uh, results first or would you like me to ask you some questions first? Oh, well, uh, so um, we'll uh, do it as follows. I'll share my screen. We'll run through about 10 minutes of uh, giving you some of the background of the project and the context within which we've done, done it. Um, I'll explain a little bit about the uh, way we've structured the workshop, which is interesting to a lot of people nowadays, now that we're having to do all of these things online instead of in person. Um, then we'll bring in two of our participants and they'll actually help us to talk you through what we actually did in the workshop. Um, and then after that, we can uh, throw to you for uh, a nice closing Q&A session. Super. So um, if that's cool with you, then I'll start sharing my screen now and we'll go into the, uh, the slides portion of this presentation. Um, let's see, let's pick this screen and share it. Um, so uh, we were both already introduced, Klaus and I, uh, oh, and I've told you roughly what we're going to talk about today. Um, and I'm just going to try to get rid of this bar of videos that's over the top of my slides. Yeah, that's where you can find us. Um, I'm Chef Van Gaalen. I'm a design researcher. I run a practice called Structure and Narrative. And maybe Klaus, you can introduce yourself yep. briefly. I'm a Klaus Kuitenbrouwer researcher in, um, well, by now transdisciplinary fields, but uh, originally in digital culture at that Nieuwe Instituut in Rotterdam and um, initiator of the ZOA project, uh, yeah. to which uh, Chef was also part actually from the very beginning. Yeah, um, yeah and the ZOA project is uh, really the background context for this idea that we've come up with. Um, when we talk about a zoonomy, that's in the context of the ZOOP. Um, so I think Klaas is going to tell you a bit about what a ZOOP is before we get into the whole rest of what this workshop is about. Super, yeah. So uh, very quickly, ZOOP is a new legal entity that we've been developing that is... Um, uh, um, the word is a combination of the Greek word for life, zoe, and zoop for short, sorry, co-op short for cooperation. Next slide, please. It has a, 
uh, oh, sorry, it has basically three goals. One is to um, enhance the legal status of non-human life within uh, capitalist cultures or uh, human societies in general, which are mostly capitalist cultures. Second goal is to support ecological regeneration. And the third kind of design feature is that it should be, this legal entity can be adopted by a huge difference of organizations. So. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, this workshop came about out of a whole series of workshops that we've been, that have been done at a new institute in uh, previous years. But as part of the program last year, uh, class and I uh, developed a performance type of workshop where um, the goal was for people to explore what it would mean to inhabit a non-human uh, perspective with the idea of having better representation for these non-human communities. Um, and our setting for that was floating platforms out in the ocean in the late 21st century where people will build their own uh, cultures. We performed this workshop for the Training for the Future program in Bochum last year yeah. and earlier this year at HIT new institute, um, but as most of you have already probably figured out by now, uh, this kind of thing where we have 30 people in a room having them build uh, cardboard worlds and uh, well, spending this much time with this many people in close proximity, we can't do anymore. Um, so when we were approached by Impact to do a workshop for this festival, obviously we had to do something online and the marine zoonomy concept was uh, born out of this. Um, and something that we wanted to do now was instead of using a fictional setting kind of far out into the future where we could uh, push ideas quite far out is instead we wanted to bring these ideas much closer to the nearer future um, and explore slightly outside of the range of what we're doing on the ground in the ZOOP project, where most of the partners that we're working with now who want to become ZOOPs are places like regenerative farms or food forests, and there's some other organizations like universities. Um, but we wanted to push the boundaries of this, so we thought about this idea of, okay, what about the marine ZOOP, seeing as uh, out in the ocean, there are also great opportunities for capturing carbon and as a society, changing the way that we uh, interact with non-human ecologies, systems and, and forms of life. Yeah. And so added to that, the, the issue of decommissioning oil rigs is a, is a huge case now that's happening all over the North Sea. It's uh, extremely expensive to remove oil rigs, but it's legally uh, obliged by big oil to do so. Uh, so to find a way to find alternative uses for these oil rigs is interesting also, at least for certain parties, economically. Although this is not our goal, but it happens uh, to find a window in which we can perceive, in which we can imagine uh, a, a ZISO, a marine zoop. And the marine zoop would so obviously add to the basic topologies of the zoop that we have uh, already now. Yeah. So... Uh... What we came up with in terms of our workshop design is uh, instead of doing a big long session, and I'm sure that many of you watching this now have experienced this where you're just in a Zoom for four or six hours and you kind of go crazy. Uh, we did a series of workshops spread over three weeks where each session was just two hours long. Um, and Klaus and I, before each workshop, did a lot of uh, preparational work to set up the scenario, to prepare a, a Miro board and, and build some structure out. So we split it over three Friday afternoons, each a session of two hours. Uh, the first session mapping, we uh, mapped out the various uh, technologies and ideas and things that currently exist in the world that would be able to work with the scenario and kind of set the political grounding as well. In the second session, succession, we drew out a timeline um, for how this could possibly all work together. And in the third session, we looked at the further order possible knock-on effects of uh, what it might mean if the situation existed in the world. And just really quickly, I can zoom out here and we can kind of fly you over what each of these sessions ended up looking like. Um, so this was our first session in which we did a lot of mapping. Our second session, at the end of this presentation, by the way, I will give the link to this Miro board so that you can view and comment. Um, we kind of got into more of a timeline structure. And then finally, 
we mapped out the effects of this thing happening. So each week, when I find where the slides are, yeah, here we go. Each week we would have um, a, a quick introduction with practical notes from myself and class. Uh, and the first week we had participant introductions, but in following on weeks, we would have uh, short reflections from our participants. Each week, class and I would update the scenario, pushing it further. So we started with just this idea of, there are these platforms in the North Sea, how can we transform them? Um, the following week, we pushed that scenario forward to say, okay, and a, a collective of people has now claimed one of these platforms. Uh, and so how are they going to use it? What are the goals of these people going to be? How is that going to change over time? And then in the third week, now we knew what the platform had become. So we asked the question of, of, okay, so now that this exists in the world, what does that mean? Um, and so with this buildup, uh, having participants come back every week, we could create a fold the scenario over and create a, a, a more and more richly structured thing. Um, and so we were really lucky with the participants uh, and the knowledge that we had coming into this. Yep. Klaus can say a bit more about that. Yeah, this was, uh, of course, uh, all this remains, uh, let's say, free form speculation if you don't have uh, kind of certain forms of grounded knowledge. And we were very lucky to have a fantastic group of participants that provided exactly that. There is um, Selina Trevisanut, who is a professor in uh, marine law, second in the second row. There's Steun Karelse, um, who is a kind of a specialist in uh, augmented ecology, artist. There is uh, Jason Perry, a ruin, an architect who works on ruin ecology. So how uh, ecologies, uh, how can uh, ecologies can emerge in uh, like ruins of uh, human structures. There's Joost, who's a seaweed farmer. There's uh, Rudy who works for 25 years on oil rigs, etc. So we had an extremely complementary and extremely kind of diverse and deep uh, set of knowledge practices present in this workshop that helped us think through all these issues. Um, yeah, so to uh, talk through what we did in the workshop, <clears throat> um, we would actually like to bring in two of those participants now. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and ask uh, Nicole and Sherry to uh, pop in um, while I introduce yeah. them briefly. Um, hey, Sherry, Hi. let's uh, add a spotlight for you. And there's Nicole, let's add a spotlight for you. Um, so Sherry and Nicole are two of the participants who were with us through the whole workshop. Uh, Sherry is a designer in physical and virtual space who's doing her PhD research on developing new models of public imagination about how we can survive better through uh, an intersection of environmental justice, uh, knowledge production systems, future design methods, and complex adaptive system science. Um, and uh, an interesting fact is that some of the research, if I recall correctly, was around the creation or the simulation of the creation of artificial reefs in Biosphere 2 in uh, Arizona. Um, which is a similar experiment to what we were kind of thinking about. And with us also, we have Nicole Jesse, who is a recent graduate. Uh, she's a curator, creator, writer, and self-publisher, interested in the facilitation of acts of peer-to-peer -peer reciprocal care um, between communities uh, of human and non-humans and the technologies that they interact with. Um, so, uh, yeah. Welcome to this final presentation of the workshop that you participated in. Um, Klaus, shall we? Uh... Yeah, um, so yeah, we uh, yeah, would like to ask you to just basically tell, yeah, well, how you experienced, but also like, the, like maybe the key findings of our workshop. So I'm going to ask you both. Um, sorry, where's my slide? Where's my pack? Oh, so could you tell us what? Um, you thought were the key constraints that we found and the key opportunities that we found in this first session where we were mapping out this, uh, this, well, this issue sphere. 
Um, yeah. Nicole, would you like to start? Yes, super. Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, um, we had a lot of legal knowledge in the first session, so it was really interesting to get to know a lot about what the legal possibilities were in terms of accessing an oil rig, um, mm -hmm. and in terms of you know this idea of who owns the the sea and who owns the water and who owns the structures within it. So, mm -hmm. in terms of constraints, I think that the the legality of it um, in the first session was something that I found um, really interesting and the idea of how to actually access the oil rig mm -hmm. as well you know it's not uh, it's not something that's that you can just kind of go to the beach and you'll be there and you know you really have to kind of think through this process of accessing it mm -hmm. and um, yeah so I think they were the the two main constraints for me that came up in the first session. So, thanks. Sherry what would you building, say? Yeah. Building on that I would say um, that started to hint at a theme that we encountered through all of the workshops, which was how does this place become self-sustaining um, in from multiple viewpoints, from legal, from economic. Um, economics came in very early on, also in terms of energy and agriculture, what's actually feasible within these waters, what might be feasible in the future, um, what might be beneficial or detrimental. Um, and also this question of, of distance, you know, is that an advantage or is that a disadvantage with this? And how will we grapple with the human factors as well as the logistics of being that far away? Like there are, there are ecosystems around these platforms now about how they're able to operate in the long term. So if we reimagine it, how do we reimagine something that's both stable and evolving, you know, from all of these viewpoints? Mm -hmm. Edward, uh, Chef, would you like to add things? Um, not necessarily add things, but uh, highlight that we ran into a number of these things that are longer running tensions that there would be with this platform. And I think we'll get to those mm -hmm. in the next few questions because there's, um, yeah, the economic cost and the way that we currently understand economic cost is, of course, incredibly high and increases the further out we go. And that was one of the things that ran throughout this workshop. But there's a, a couple of these themes where um, obviously uh, these platforms don't exist for no reason currently. And there's already a lot of uh, thinking and structures built around them. But the um, reimagining of them um, is where we run into these things and kind of start to slide uh, back and forth with the development over time. Yeah. So uh, after this first session, we um, in which we had legal expertise brought in from um, Celine Treviso, uh, there was some uh, core sticking points that we tried to push past for the second issue to say, okay, we've we've solved that, and not to magic wand wave it away, but we've made a construction now. And which, uh, okay, uh, a group has successfully argued that them taking over this platform is some kind of environmental benefit. They've been allowed to do it. They've worked out an agreement. So now, uh, how would this platform develop over time? Yeah. Um, so that was the question and in the second session. Can I add a, a, one, one detail? Because it, sure. uh, uh, it turned out that this is actually, uh, let's say, at least plausible. Uh, that yes. To to actually that the fact that this structure is there, it's extremely expensive to remove it, which is now obliged by the by European frameworks that big oil removes those platforms. To keep it there uh, uh, has possibilities, and so you would, uh, if a group would take over such a platform, it would actually, um, as, let's say, uh, save, which was of course also an issue, save a lot of costs for uh, oil factories. Uh, oil uh, companies at the same time because this like saves millions there is uh, like a realistic opportunity that this is actually a plausible scenario yeah that was uh, and legally there's business. also the room uh, that this uh, if you like, remove toxics if uh, then it's not there's no dumping uh, which is forbidden obviously but then like an, a metal structure in the sea can remain there uh, if it uh, provides ecological benefits. So yeah. we identified this uh, as, a, as a realistic frame. We, we, yeah, we yeah. set it up so that this is a thing that could actually happen. It yeah. wouldn't be easy, but you could do it. Yeah. Um, so in the next stage, we looked at the succession of events, kind of. Um, so could the two of you maybe tell us uh, what you remember from, or summarize from uh, 
how this platform would then, if it existed, develop over time, over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and maybe we'll kick off with Sherry this time, just to go back and forth. So we went from feasibility to really talking about maintenance and care. Um, mm. So in, we almost immediately as a group started shifting to the cultural aspects of that, you know, including kind of local logistics, but mostly about people, even in terms of, of maintenance. Um, but we also started connecting it to like, what can we do here, but how can it be connected to something larger, whether it was larger initiatives around this, becoming models for others, becoming parts of networks. Um, is it a larger network of remediation? And in some cases, revision, like how does this become part of a revitalization to a different way forward? So even though we discussed so many challenges in the first week, we talked about what might be uniquely possible here due to the locations and intersections of expertise. So we started imagining um, a whole cohort of people, including oil workers who mm -hmm. could maintain the platform and also retrain for renewable technologies um, that would be used to power the platform alongside scientists, educators, and different kinds of communicators that like, platform veterans could become communicators for visitors and distance learning. Experiments could be connected between the platform, other platforms, potentially classrooms, artists, designers, other types of communicators could both document and archive the renovation process. It could also become a catalyst for experimenting with different types of communication, maybe providing benchmarks for others interested in how to communicate and help us imagine similar topics. I think for me, this was really my favorite part of the workshop. And I think kind of pushing past this idea of why can't we do it? And let's just think, well, what if we could do it? And what would that look like? And I think that that's where this really interesting group of people within the workshop with all their different skills and backgrounds really kind of came into their own and everyone was drawing on their own experiences to imagine what this could look like. And I think that that was, for me, definitely the most exciting part and uh, trying to imagine the kind of free uh, pre-figurative politics of how a group of people self-organize and how this could really work in terms of social dynamics in a, on a, on a fairly small scale and also the idea of scale, what would work, you know, how many people um, would it work to um, inhabit this structure before it started to get maybe unsustainable or difficult. Um, and yeah, this idea of community and everyone having their own role and responsibility within the group um, and how that can kind of, you know, lead to a more sustained cooperation between people. And then yeah, so it was really the dynamics between the people. And then for me, this was also really interesting because it, it was this idea of mutual care between people and the environment. And how can mm -hmm. we create somewhere in which the people are also cared for at the same time as um, the ecological aspects are being cared for? And, um, you know, there's so many things to think about. Like if you're um, distance on a platform, then you have things like mental health to think about, people missing their families boredom you know all these different aspects so um yeah i found this definitely uh, for me the best part <laughs> mm -hmm. um next, yeah next. yeah go ahead class yeah so that uh uh yoast brought who was the seaweed farmer also brought uh, some uh, very interesting kind of ecological dimensions here like um basically explaining how kelp, which is the fastest growing, well, general type of seaweed, uh, well, basically grows freely on an, any form structure in the right uh, uh, conditions. And the conditions are, are very generous. And these would be the conditions that you find on an on a oil rig uh, at 200 uh, nautical miles in the North Sea. Uh, and that also in, for instance, uh, fjords in Norway, you have these vertical ecosystems that go all the way down to the bottom of the sea. And this would exactly be the kind of ecosystem that you could generate on a firm structure uh, down at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at an oil rig. Added to that was also like the imagination, actually also the calculation or very kind of uh, wet finger as the Dutch expression goes, uh, uh, that you could achieve um, energy and um, food independence on an oil rig like that. There's enough kind of surface. Seaweed is an ideal soil starter that coupled with uh, bird poo would really give a very fertile basis also for land-based agriculture. One or two windmills would generate more than enough energy to basically power your, uh, power your operations there. So all this, this uh, still looks plausible. That's... Um, 
Yeah, well, this where, is the first where I think we ended up. Session. Yeah, yeah, where I think we ended up at the end of this is um, uh, while we didn't really have a, a traditionally viable business case, the plausible model that we came up with was um, that this would function also as a kind of uh, training or retraining hub. Mm -hmm. uh, that this would be the visitor flow would also be for the uh, retraining of. Um, people from the oil industry, but not only that, using this uh, independence with regenerative aquaculture and experiments in offshore energy um, to be retraining people in these practices as well and using the remoteness of the location as a bonus. Um, exactly. yep. So as these uh, other industries would expand, not doing it in a way where it's a huge um, top-down kind of plan, but uh, training people to be able to spin off these industries because they're possible at smaller scales to, to do them themselves and, yeah. and uh, uh, create other groups as well. So um, moving was, then on into the... Uh, that, there was one more thing maybe that I think we should add here also that, that what... Oh, okay, that's the third session. That was yeah, so I'm rolling sorry, into sorry. the third session where that's probably going to come up, what you yep. want to say right now. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, but in, in the third session, go ahead, class, and then we'll roll into the question for that. Uh, but it also ties in with what Sherry said. It's about uh, uh, not only tying in with land-based networks, but also tying in with sea-based networks. Because uh, in the near future, the regenerative, en the, the renewable energy infrastructure in the North Sea is really bound to grow. It's uh, that's all set now. This wind farms on the Doggerbank and other places will really kind of start which would not also not only provide an, a kind of an energy infrastructure, but also an ecological infrastructure because, because the sea bottom will then be firmed again. And this is already what you see when you build uh, min windmills in the sea that immediately ossels and oysters and kelp and all these and fishes and the whole kind of related sea uh, marine ecosystem start to regenerate. So this further away oil rig would also benefit from that already regenerating, uh, regenerating uh, ecosystem uh, closer to the shore. Yeah, so the, the, in our Next as the day. expert yeah. introduction of our third session, we had uh, Peter Scheigrond, who is uh, an expert in this field of uh, offshore renewable energy. And he set up some of the projects that are currently already running that do similar things to this. And his focus was really on the interactions that would be possible between these things. Um, but with these interactions come certain tensions. So as a final question, um, just about these, these sessions, um, what to you, Sherry and Nicole, did you find to be the, the, the most important fields of tension that this scenario would um, agitate, as it were? Yeah, I think we spoke a lot about how to foster cooperation between this kind of project and the petrochemical industry, um, who would initially have had access to these kinds of structures and how to, um, I guess, gain agency within this really politicized space of these uh, corporations that have an agenda that's financial, you know, and isn't really anything else and how to kind of navigate that and mm -hmm. um, yeah, how to generate agency for ourselves um, as a project, which um, maybe, you know, we might need to kind of fight for opposition there um, in their eyes. Um, and then we also spoke about a knock on effect of that being greenwashing and how to kind of um, come up with, yeah, some mm -hmm. kind of, um, yeah, some kind of way to avoid this being taken on um, as a way for th these companies to um, to greenwash essentially. So I think that yeah, it was those kinds of collaborations between us and the petrochemical industry, mm -hmm. or maybe not necessarily to avoid the greenwashing, but to go into it with open eyes and knowing exactly how clean everyone would come out. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, to get the. Um, to make, I mean, it's not really win-win, but it's it's you get to get away with stuff, and maybe we win something. Hopefully, um, mm, yeah, yeah exactly. to make the best out of a, a to put it lightly, not so great situation. Yeah, yeah, um, Very, yes. yeah. The other biggest threat we talked about was kind of at a different scale, which was about how do we not stagnate as a project. Mm -hmm. um, there might be a potential tension becoming, between becoming stable enough um, to be economically viable and, and self-sustaining, but stagnation mm -hmm. is completely antithetical to the project as a whole. So how do we mm -hmm. maybe, instead of thinking about an equilibrium, think, of, think about it as robustness, 
um, for complexity and evolving? Um, how does it become um, stable while continuing to grow? And if like, how does it grow and evolve as a part of a, as a socio-ecological and a technical environment? Um, so that we're always thinking about these multiple aspects that we've brought up from the beginning. Um, one of the ways that we talked about potentially thinking about it is like, how could this place itself become a boundary object of many imaginations? Like yeah. how can many stakeholders imagine it for themselves or working to accomplish broad common goals in a way that can um, accomplish milestones and things in shorter terms, but also continue to be something both aspirational and pragmatic in the long term. Yeah, great. Yeah. There's a, yeah, class, you have a yeah, final, uh, an extra point to add to this. Yeah, there was one thing that also I find very interesting is that, um, and this is part of the current, this already part of the mapping that you see that, let's say there's economic zones in the North Sea and then there's nature zones. Uh, you have nature 2000 areas where uh, yeah. everything is protected and then you have other areas where you can do pretty much everything and drill and etc. Well, except for dumping. And um, so an, an issue that's uh, uh, implied in our operation is that you have to kind of abandon these kinds of categorizations because this would be a completely new kind of, in that sense, a new kind of operation. It would both, it would be not a cash cow, but at least economically viable. It would be ecologically regenerative, but still also be economically, uh, let's say, viable. It would um, kind of turn around the whole idea of growth and uh, so that you don't only do this because it will provide you with profit, but because it will provide, let's say, ecological or zoonomical profit. Um, so it would be really, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, an extreme hybrid uh, beyond our current ways of thinking about the divisions between uh, economy and ecology, technology, human and non-human. And this complete hybridity also provokes new modes of regulation. This, this is not provided for in the law and or any protocols in, the, in, 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 the, in, in economy. So this would be, I find this also a very interesting dimension that uh, of course we're waiting for these things, but we got now a kind of a narrative which, on which you can actually, here you find the problem in the field, which I find really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so to bookend with how we started the first session with an introduction into the poli political reality of this, mm -hmm. we then end up with um, what you just said and one of our participants brought up the very interesting point that if you were to actually do this, you could use this practical example to actually uh, force regulation. Exactly. Um, just go ahead and do it. And then it would have to be legislated. And then we would have to politically come to terms with this uh, new hybridity, which would inevitably bring its own set of problems, challenges, complications, et cetera. But then it's, it's actually happening. Um, so I think with that, we've, we've kind of wrapped up what we discussed in the three sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, and to conclude, you've both already actually kind of um, touched on this, but maybe you can just, uh, in closing, comment on um, how you found this uh, workshop format, this series, the, uh, doing it in a series and using this uh, speculative dimension to explore something that is really quite near to the now and pulling it closer into plausibility. Yeah, I can, um, I think, yeah, for me, uh, coming from an art background, I was really, you know, the whole time thinking through the agency of the artist and what is the role of the artist within a project like this. And, you know, being able to dream a little bit and imagine and speculate about um, future scenarios and maybe, you know, even build some kind of narrative around this project for me was the most interesting part. And um, yeah, being able to, imagine how these social relationships as well um, could play out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciated how generous and collaborative everyone was. And one of the things I think was actually a unique opportunity of being forced into the Zoom world rather than in person is that, you know, I'm quite far, I was able to be a part, but also I, the special, the specialty expertise, like I, having Rudy, the oil operator, you know, the oil rig operator as a part of it, having people be able to come in for, for pieces of it, the legal experts, you know, in a way that we might, may or may not have had that expertise at the table and that kind of participation um, was really exciting to me as well. Yeah, nothing to add there. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, thanks both of you so much for uh, coming in and joining us for this final part of the, the, the presentation. Um, I guess that concludes our little roundup, unless you have anything to add right now, Klaus? No, no, no. This cool. Then I'll share my perfect. screen for just a, a few seconds while we uh, close up, uh, just so that um, share. everyone can see this last slide in which we uh, thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, if you want more information on the ZOAP project, you can go to ZOAP dot at new institute dot nl uh, and you can find much more lab reports from workshop background on the program etc there if you want to go and look at the Miro board that we built during this workshop session the url for that is there as well and i'm um, yeah this is the easiest way to find it now uh, we'd like to ask arion to join us again arion donovan the director of the impact festival for a kind of closing Q&A with everybody, and um, maybe even with other audience. Yeah. Um, Hi, Ariel. You have Let's, video, uh, you have audio. Add you have a spotlight for you. Yep, you're in. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Chef and Klaas, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation, like shedding a totally, at least for me, new light on uh, climate crisis, on sustainability, and how we can uh, uh, look for solutions. Um, and, and uh, um, look at new places to find solutions, like the old platforms. Mm -hmm. um, what are your future plans? I'm very curious to know, how will you um, um, uh, continue this project and how do these plans, the future plans fit within the ZUA project? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, we've been asked this by a couple of participants as well, in particular who were, uh, some people were really enthusiastic to actually start making this happen uh, right now. Well, Harry, um, who lives in Scotland, watches from his window, actually decommissioned oil rigs uh, being taken apart at the harbor where he lives. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, in, in the first place right now for this workshop, the idea was just to flesh this scenario out and basically put it out into the world. Um, and while we're not immediately planning to go out and get funding to try to do this, we would entirely not be opposed to somebody actually doing it uh, and would really like to help them. But so in terms of doing this kind of thing for the broader uh, ZOA project, um, this is kind of the, the work that I do within the project is always trying to find ways in which we can uh, investigate the possibilities of where it could go in the near future and kind of try to push it forward. Yeah. Um, Klaas, can you maybe say a little bit yeah. about? I think what is uh, key to me is that it's not only speculative, but actually plausible. Uh, yeah. that we, so that was to me the interesting dimension that we, uh, we didn't kind of explore in our previous workshop, uh, uh, zoonomic futures, but here that it was actually tied to the plausible, that we tried to like work within realistic constraints and in those, uh, within those constraints be as imaginative as possible. And I think this is also actually a key element of the ZOA project in general, that we, uh, we, we don't want to be only uh, critiquing and not only being speculative, but we actually want to use our imagination to actually change something. So it's not speculative design, but actual design. And this is, in fact, the genesis of the ZOA project was a series of workshops, the Terraforming Earth workshops in 2018, where this idea of the ZOA, this new form of incorporation with non-humans, was born uh, in the very first workshop in that series, further developed in the second. And by the time we got to the third workshop in that year, we were saying, actually, this would only still be interesting to us if we went and did it. Yeah. And as of a few months ago, a large law firm in the Netherlands yeah. has actually drawn up the charter yeah. for this yeah. uh, legal yeah. construction. So it will exist now. Yeah. So uh, De Brouw, which is uh, like a major law firm in the Zuidas, is uh, actually helping us uh, writing out the actual ZOOP uh, constructs, the, the, the contracts and the, and the regulations. We have at this moment seven organizations in the Netherlands calling themselves proto zoop so on their way to become ZOOPs. And next to that, there will be uh, a new one in Berlin shortly. There's also an, an organization in Paris and We Are Here Venice. That's an NGO in Venice that works with the, the Lagoon that's uh, on their way to become a ZOOP. And uh, yeah, we're looking at uh, early 2021 to when we have the actual charter. So that's like three to four months from now. And um, uh, yeah, we aim to f f uh, uh, found, to initiate the first actual ZOOP in, 
uh, yes, spring 2021, which is the beginning of the growth season. It's the best moment to actually start a zoop. Um, and Jason Perry, will, uh, who was participant to this workshop, will start a zoop course in um, uh, in his university in the United States. And so it keeps expanding. And uh, yeah. yeah, this is our, uh, yeah, that, that is kind of maybe rather um, unlikely scenario actually becomes real is uh, extremely exciting and also helps to keep many people sane in these. Uh, that you, it yeah. is, uh, in that sense, very empowering to be able to do something that, that seems to make sense. And that's, and that's the area we, we want to be working in, where we're not, we just, to be. Yeah. Yeah, not just exploring these alternative futures, but actually trying to uh, not just pull them closer to reality, but then even move them forward, them flip it over, make them real, and then push forward again. It's, yeah. Okay, we've done this now. How much further can we go? Yeah. Um, we can take questions from the audience. Um, you can email them to questions at impact.nl. So anyone... Uh, seeing this presentation with questions for either a chef or class, or maybe for Nicole or Sherry, um, please uh, email them to us. Um, I already have one question here. Um, let me try and read it out for you. It's a long one, so I'll do my best. <laughs> it's a question from Laura. As technological solutions to the climate crisis are amplifying, and while in many ways it is alienating human from non-human enhancing, from non-human, enhancing the culture nature dichotomy even further. Is there a way we can use technology in bringing the human population closer to nature? I hope you, would you be got a, the question. It's a, it's a... Would be a fantastic question for Tone, because that's exactly his work. But uh, yeah. since he's, yeah, we have to he's channel Tone now a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, there's certainly a place for it. And maybe either of our participants actually wants to chime in on this one. Yeah, I think this is also in your area of expertise, uh, Sherry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's exactly what we're talking about. I mean, it, the, the platform itself is a technology, right? It is part of a larger uh, socio-technical and ecological technical construct. And what we're trying to do is reimagine the ways in which um, that remaining infrastructure, which still has its component parts, like how can we make it operate differently and operate in a way that is more complementary and almost not necessarily symbiotic, but almost sympoetic with the ecological environment around it. Um, so it's, you know, this might not be the right words, but I think that it's almost like terraforming the technology, right? Like that we're trying to take these pieces, we're not making them less technical. We're trying to rethink and recompile even the potential addition of, of renewable energy or the, the kinds of pieces that would need to be brought in for the aquaculture. You're reforming it and trying to break, to my mind, what we've discussed is, is breaking down the binaries um, and trying to imagine the places where the ecology, the technology, and the humans blend in ways that can make it more, more um, complementary and sustainable. Yeah, and I, I guess maybe, Nicole, you would like to add to that possibly from the perspective, which would also have been Tone's perspective, of um, the role of the arts in this. Um, yeah, for sure, and I think that uh, narrative plays a big part as well in kind of breaking down those barriers of what the binaries currently are and how we can break through them. And I think kind of, yeah, removing this, the, the constraints of reality and really allowing yourself to imagine how things could be different. Um, and then putting those uh, kind of boundaries back in place and trying to work around them. I think that's really how the artist can come in, you know, this, this mm -hmm. role of imagination and the the role of experimentation and I think that um, the the agency of the artist is uh, incredibly strong within a project like this. Yeah yeah and then in, in, in terms of um, the idea of technology causing mm. this uh, alienation and the, the nature culture um, di divide dichotomy um, I mean I guess what we see in a lot of the the ZOA projects is um, people finding ways to reconnect with landscape and ecology as well. Um, but 
uh, while technology can play a role in bringing in those connections, I think that's something that really has to also be part of a human experience. Um, it's really like uh, boots on the ground uh, type of <laughs> thing. Maybe the bit, a little bit of awkward metaphor here. But... Yeah, well, uh, it's better in Dutch when you say feet in the earth. Yeah, right. Um, boots on the ground is like this military... Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. No, foot in the aarde. Yeah, right. Um, oh, yeah. Foot in, I guess it's in the, the soil. The yeah. The question is also a lot about framing if you want to see technology as part of the problem or part of the solution or what your definition is of technology. Is it a very narrow yeah. definition like, okay, it's with a plug and a circuit board, that's technology, or technology is any kind of concept that ties other concepts together or makes us yeah. interact with our environment. So Exactly, uh, yeah. It well, and, like, and like, sorry, yeah, the, like yeah. agriculture was a technology that was invented 10,000 years ago. Uh, a set of technologies that has kept on developing and has now kind of largely kind of, uh, let's say, got loose from its origins, but still can be reconnected. There's various types of uh, agriculture which are very kind of ecologically beneficial, which do lead to ecological I mean, it's not necessarily opposed to, um, to biodiversity and soil health and all these things. And it can also sink a lot of carbon and can all do, do all these things. It's, it's a, so it's not not technology, it's just a different kind of technology. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, and, and also as technologies become more accepted, widespread, and they become part of the infrastructure, they tend to disappear. and We forget that they're technology, as yeah. Sherry just pointed out. Um, they become part of these much larger systems that uh, once it's no longer, a, you know, the spectac spectacular uh, magical thing, like it's, mm -hmm. you'll see a lot of, um, let's have some AI reorganize this ecology for us or, uh, you know, the kind of buzzwordy things that um, are, they can be traps. Uh, we all use them a lot in the, uh, artistic practice. Uh, you see them popping a lot up in exhibitions like this, but yeah, the, those aren't necessarily actually the technologies when you're thinking about technology in its broader sense that are uh, the ones that so we're dealing with. We've, we've got about 12 minutes left uh, for this Q&A. Um, I'd like to dig in a bit deeper into, uh, I think it was either Nicole or Sherry who mentioned the greenwashing uh, uh, mm. component. Um, I'd like to know more about that. Like how, how would you position yourself? Imagine uh, you get a phone call from Shell. We've got uh, an abandoned oil platform. Please come and use it. You're free to do what you want. How would you respond? Uh, well, so that scenario would already start off a lot more complicated um, and fortunately, we had our marine law expert in the first session to kind of set the record straight for us on this kind of thing. Um, meaning what? I mean, what did they set straight? Meaning, so you wouldn't just get a call from Shell who were like, hey, we have this platform. Do you want it? Cool. Goodbye. Um, these right, platforms. You can buy it for one euro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, they all have to have a plan for these things to be decommissioned. They're not allowed to just leave waste in the sea. And the challenge, if you were an organization that wanted to start having one of these things, um, you could probably work out some kind of deal if there is a way uh, for it to be more uh, economically advantageous to the oil company to leave it to you, that would work out. But um, legally, you would have to be able to prove that you taking over this oil platform has an environmental benefit, that the sea would be better off because that actually uh, is happening. Um, and that's where the, the boundary that we pushed past after our first session to say that that had already happened uh, for the second. Um, Klaus, do you have an addition to that? No, but it, it, so, uh, and again, this is plausible. Right? That's like with the knowledge that Joost brought in, like you can use the scrap metal of the top structure of this uh, uh, oil field or uh, oil rig had to build firm structures under the sea level that would have become the platform on which a lot of uh, the kelp and other uh, sea life would start to grow. This is not. Uh, this is certainly not rocket science. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this you can do if you have the right people and um, uh, equipment. But and to bring it back to your sorry, question about yeah, yeah. Uh, let's say the amount of costs involved in removing an oil rig are millions. So a fraction of that would be enough to do this. So let's say from the perspective, this is of course the this is the big ethical question. So uh, we're actually taking a problem of, of, of big oil off their hands. Right? Like, do we want to do this? And that's exactly what, what, what Chef also tried to say. Like, well, 
if the ecological benefit is is serious, then well, we might consider actually taking a problem of big oil off their hands, and then, yeah. But we're still we're, we we will always be in this tension. We will uh, there's no way around it. So we have to let's say accept that we then yeah are in this situation. We cannot just close our eyes from it. Um, but maybe let's put this then in a more plausible scenario where Shell would call you and say, well, we have our website, we present a company there. And of course, we're all about looking for alternative uh, energy sources and uh, sustainability. We would like to have an interview with you and you could present your project uh, and your picture would be featured on the website. But what kind yeah. of conditions would you put to them? OK, we can go along, but only under these conditions. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, um, because then we're really getting much more towards the greenwashy side of exactly. uh, this thing. So, um, well, that's one of the reasons kind of why we wanted to flesh out this scenario now, because, um, mm -hmm. I mean, Shell is at the, the genesis of the use of scenarios in futures work, right? Uh, they, they have their own future scenarios that they put out, um, and Shell will have a nice, thick, very beautifully produced report that says, hey, look, we see these things could happen in the future. It could go this way, it could go this way, it could go this way, or it could go this way. You have four options. And then recently they went, oh yeah, there's also a number five. Um, but obviously Shell has thought about a lot more than these four different options. And the futures that they present to the world are all four futures within which Shell A exists, B is still a really highly profitable company. There is no scenario six, seven, eight, nine, ten, in which Shell has been litigated into the ground, in which uh, has been boycotted by millions of people, which just uh, uh, has somehow, through shareholder trickery, ceased to exist entirely. There is no radical uh, transformation in those scenarios. It's always just ah, well, we want to yeah. be part of the conversation. Let's just take another few decades to talk about it. Can I add a little fun fact to this? Uh, uh, um, uh, the, the pension fund ABP, the biggest pension fund of, uh, of, of the Netherlands, uh, in this, uh, this first half year of 2020, has um, sold 40% of their st stock of Shell. So the stock of Shell, the total worth of the stock of Shell, at the end of 2019 was worth 512 million. And media 2020 is only 162 million. I heard it on the, the news, but do you know if it was it because they don't want to be associated anymore with with Shell as a not environmentally friendly company, or what? Well, it's a little bit more cynical. It's like investing in big oil is just not a good investment anymore. It's yeah. not because we want to save the world. No, we want to save our company, and because mm -hmm. we want to save our company, we kind of divert from fossil fuel, which is mm -hmm. the cynical, but at this moment the realistic reason. But this is. This is the scenario which we... So in this context, if Shell is still obliged to remove oil fields, uh, which costs like, I don't know how many millions to remove, then uh, this, this R scenario number eight on the Shell list uh, becomes extremely interesting. And yeah, in that sense, the, uh, so um, let's say the conditions that... Um, I'm not sure if we would we want to feature on the Shell website to save That's their future... Not this. I mean, hopefully we don't need to be on the Shell on the Shell website to do this. Uh, but uh, uh, for me, it would be uh, the condition would be that Shell becomes a ZOOP, and then the ZOOP <laughs> regulation is actually pretty firm. So I'm not pretty sure they can't do this right now. So, but yeah, otherwise, why would we do it? It's. Um, I mean, let's say model-wise, it's definitely possible that Shell becomes a ZOOP, but profit-wise, it's not in their interest. And they would have to uh, become a very different kind of energy company to become a ZOOP. Yeah. And that's really the, the whole ZOOP idea. And uh, what was brought up often in the workshop is, uh, yeah, that, that idea of a business case and how will you make a profit? And it's like kind of irrelevant even because this thing isn't about turning a profit in the sense that uh, yeah. value was currently yeah. constructed. Yeah. We've yeah, got only about five end. minutes left. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've got one question: is to which extent would shipwrecks uh, also be uh, uh, a place or the objects to uh, uh, to use instead of oil platforms? Um, could you do the, the same project, uh, but then using uh, uh, shipwrecks on the? So um, I think that already platform. exists. Uh, uh, and has done quite a lot. There's a program called Rigs to Reefs, where they basically take these oil rigs and they just sink them. 
and then the reef uh, becomes a new underseas environment. And the reason that uh, we kind of uh, had that route in our Miro board but didn't take it is because we are interested in actually uh, keeping something above sea level at the surface and still having this human dimension included uh, and using that place as a, as a transactional space that facilitates this transformation. Um, so yes, you can just sink the things and they can become new, new uh, ecological hotspots, but we really wanted to still have humans involved and therefore be forced to think about how they could work with this uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are there maybe a few final words you'd like to say um, if people want to see a next presentation, a next workshop to participate in, where would they go to? Uh, if people want to join, what can they do? Um, we've got about three minutes left before we switch over to the next uh, program part. Um, funny enough, next week in Utrecht, the University College Utrecht does their uh, uh, Zoop Sprouting Festival. They actually have announced publicly that it will become a proto zoop uh, next week, I'll be speaking in uh, Brandenhofer, sorry, the architectural school in Zurich on the Zoop, and then the week after in Berlin. Um, uh, but if you want to stay informed, the best is to just uh, uh, add your name to the mailing list. And that, for that, you have to go to zoop.hetnieuweinstituut.nl. That's the, uh, in the last slide that uh, Chef showed. So if you want to check back on the recording. Um, and there's a mailing list that you can just register to, and then you get Zoop news. Um, so that's the, the easiest bit. Yep. And if you're seriously thinking of starting a ZOOP, just uh, mail ZOOP at hetnieuweinstituut.nl. Just send, your, uh, send an email there and then we can, uh, yeah, we'll uh, happy to talk. Yeah. Super. Um, thanks Even a if lot. you're an oil company. Yeah. <laughs> Especially. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chef van Galen. And thanks, Klaas Kuitenbrouwer. Thanks, Nicole and Sherry for being with us. Um, I think it's now time to uh, preview what we're going to see next. Uh, that will be another round of Impact TV with our host Ilga Mignon for today. Uh, and we'll have an interview with Marlijn Twaalfhoven, among other, um, and also an introduction to a next screening, uh, Xino, Xino, sorry, Xenogenesis by the Otholith Group. can recommend that uh, uh, very much. Um, so thanks again and see you later. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Impact. Thank you, Ibrahim. Yes. Hello, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Impact TV channel. You're watching the Impact Festival 2020, living and connecting on a damaged earth. And um, we're uh, taking off from the uh, previous panel, um, well, let's say from one uh, interdisciplinary and uh, perhaps hopeful approach in the face of huge problems to the next. Um, next up scheduled in our program is an interview with Merlijn Twaalfhoven. Um, he is a Dutch composer who studied at the Conservatory of Amsterdam. Nowadays, Merlijn works as a creative researcher to solve complex societal problems. He is the writer of the book Het is aan ons, uh, roughly translated as uh, It's up to us. He uh, writes about activating our artistic mindset to take on problems in the world, both big and small. He states that every human being has creative potential, which can be used greatly not only to develop one's emotions, dreams and doubts, but also to soften the pain and the chaos from the current world we live in. And uh, I took a look at uh, his website. There are already some really interesting uh, bits of his work, but as a special access to understanding more about his methods, and his doubts. Um, in a minute, we'll have a Zoom interview with Merlijn. Um, so uh, please stick around for this. If you're interested in 